Well, street fighting was illegal. It was during the Depression. Um, uh, these were, I think, Hard Times is really kind of based on, uh, I'm not talking about the origins of the script now. It had gone through many phases before I, I got into the picture. But, but um, uh, stories that I heard from uh, my grandfather and my father about uh, things that would happen back in the 30s, the, the kind of desperate times that people had and the things that they would do uh, for money. If you look over on the wall over there, you'll see a, a wonderful picture taken of my grandfather in the 1920s on a uh, drilling rig in, uh, I believe it's in Taft, California. He was very fond of telling the story. They had a, they had a guy in the oil fields who was their big tough guy. My grandfather was rather an athlete. He had been something of a tramp athlete in his school days. And, uh, uh, and had boxed a little, but they had a guy in the oil fields that um, um, was their local champion who would fight for money against the champions of other drilling outfits or other oil fields down the down the road, that kind of thing, other oil patches. And uh, <laughs> there was some guy that showed up, uh, Hobo, who... Uh, uh, was looking for some food, and he said, happened to see the fight or something, and said, you know, you guys feed me for a while, and uh, I'll take care of I'll take care of the other guys. You know, I'll fight, and I'll take care of them. You guys will win your bets. And uh, he said, you know, the son of a bitch, <laughs> it, it was true. He, he, he won two or three fights. They won money, and they woke up one morning, and he was gone, and that was it. You know, he had jumped on a train or something like that. My grandfather never, you know, he never got tired of telling this. He ne never knew what happened. They, they had absolutely no idea what ever happened to this guy, young guy, you know, um, the, the, you know, the ghost. He uh, didn't, didn't say much. So I guess in a lot of ways you can see that this relates to uh, the movie. Somebody who thinks he's tough as a nickel steak. But they all come to speed for the do re mi. Now get this. We ain't partners. We ain't brothers and we ain't friends. My little brother was 15 years old. You think about that. You're way up hell. How about cutting hands? Oh, I get it. You want some kind of contest, huh? You real smart boys. I guess maybe you'll have to kill me. Well, it looks like I finally ran into someone that likes to play as rough as I do. Yeah, this must be a lucky night. And my bodies, they're not nice like me. Are we supposed to say thanks? You're not supposed to say nothing. Told ya. Now, tell me, how'd you make money? I knock people down. You mean like a prize fighter? No, they're pickup fights. The money's made on bets. 1933, America had hit the skids. People were out of work and out of luck. Life was as tough as a cheap steak. Well, you've been down the long, hard road. Who has it? It was hard times. I got a husband in jail, no job, and no prospects. I don't look past the next bend in a road. Columbia Pictures presents Hard Times. Starring Charles Bronson as Cheney, a drifter. When I get enough change in my pocket, I'm going. A loner. Are you going to stay the night? Not this time. A man who spoke soft. I barely know you. Yeah, but would you like to? And hit hard. <laughs> James Coburn as Speed, a born con man. All side bets, I keep 75%. That's how it works. Who can make a fortune in a day. I propose the toast to the best man I know. Me. And lose it in a minute. What the hell are you doing? I don't want no trouble. Just you pay your debts. Speed was the hustler. Cheney was the hitter. Together, they just couldn't be beat. 
Charles Bronson and James Colbert. Together, they're a knockout. In hard times. Hello, folks. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Last Call of Torchies. Uh, what is that, you ask? Well, Torches is a bar that shows up in a lot of Walter Hill films. So this is our big foray into Walter Hill's career. I feel if you're an old school listener of Cinema Beef, um, our very first year, we did like eight, eight Walter Hill shows for the first anniversary. Well, those are lost in a fire somewhere. So I chose to get this group of guys together and uh, that, that love these as much as I do. And we're going to do them over again one by one for you guys. And um. I'll introduce you guys first of all. These are guys you may have heard on my shows before and hopefully heard on their shows. Um, I'll, I'll kick it to my, my buddy here from, from, from Canada, and uh, he's awesome. He does a show called The Most You Destroyed on Sight. Uh, Mr. Lee Russell, how you doing, sir? Oh, I'm doing great, man. Um, pretty excited to do this uh, because I'll be able to, you know, basically finish off the rest of the Walter Hill stuff I haven't seen, and uh, which is sadly probably quite a bit actually I, I think my sort of watching of his stuff ends like there, there's a big gap of it in it between like the 70s and then you get to like wild bill or something like that and then i think after then i oh the last thing i saw of his was what that uh, stallone one bullet to the head or whatever uh mm. yeah but um yeah there's there's definitely some mm-hmm. holes in my walter hill watching and uh i look forward to uh doing it with you guys uh, it'll be great Cool. Um, you gotta have favorites, man. So I'll ask you right here at this point. Um, if you had to pick three on a desert island, which ones would you pick? Oh, um, well, spoilers for this episode: Hard Times, uh, The Driver, and probably The Warriors is is probably where I would go, and that's probably that's probably where a lot of people would go. I imagine when you when you ask ask them about their Walter Hill uh, likes, but uh, yeah. And that's fair because you know if you look at this his uh you know not only the directing but the writing you know his catalog <laughs> all the way from the sixties on to th- through the seventies and the, the early eighties if you will um it's quite a run yeah it, this is why this is why I'm in love with this this writer director producer so much is that if you look at it it's kind of astounding and if, if you've never seen it before like. I'm sure the driver is going to be a, an empty hole in some people's lives. And once they watch it, they watch how good the acting is in those, that movie. You know, they're going to say, wow, where, where has this been all my life? <laughs> yeah. I had a friend like that. With, with, I had a friend like that with, with the Warriors. Never seen the Warriors. Refused to watch it. This is going to be so stupid. He called me the next day and said, you know, I guess I'm wrong. I was like, I guess you are, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Warriors, stupid. Come on. Oh, man. <laughs> he was not feeling it, man. But, um, yeah. My other brother, uh, I'm looking on the screen right now, to, to, to the right of me, if you will, uh, he does podcast, has a family of podcasts in the Cinema Degeneration fa- catalog. Uh, Mr. Lee Russell, how you doing? I mean, not Lee Russell. Your name is Cameron Scott. How you doing, sir? <laughs> I'm doing pretty fabulous. I'm looking forward to this. I've been looking forward to this since uh, you told me about it months and months ago. So, Walter Hill, he has such a great, an immense catalog of films. I mean, nearly 30 different directorial efforts and most of them pretty fucking solid you know so yeah i'm definitely looking forward to this uh same question to you uh desert island what three would you take with you uh i take the warriors extreme prejudice and last man standing Ooh. see that's that's one the one in the middle there that people are gonna say well this cast is, is so immense of people that i love why haven't I seen it? I think Extreme Prejudice is going to be a deep hole in people's thoughts and, you know, never heard of it or something. It's like, wow, I got to check this out. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I mean, that's just me uh, talking, you know. Yeah, Extreme Prejudice is definitely uh, underrated. I mean, is Power, Powers Booth playing the sleaziest character ever, ever. You know, I just, I love it. So sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, there's so much sweat in that movie. Oh, my gosh. And then we got uh, uh, me, know, myself, Lamar oh, from Revenge. Yeah, Lamar from Revenge of the Nerds, man, in an M60, and that you know what's not to love. People, <laughs> people forget that he's another shit. I like that guy was extreme prejudice. He was an Iron Eagle, and he was in Lambda. So you know, you got to got to love uh, yeah. Mr. Larry Scott and a Cobra Kai as well. I forgot about that. You know, that's right, Cobra yeah. Kai, <laughs> Snake Eater series too. Oh no. wow, <laughs> Lorenzo Lamas. <laughs> when you, when you do your, no, when you do your sequel show, 
because mine's kind of dead in the water at the moment. I'm fine with that. Um, n- not really. What we might, we might, who knows what will happen next. Uh, when you get to that Snake Eater series, you let me know. I'll come on those shows. <laughs> right on. Yeah, yeah. Never say never. Never say die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, same question poised to myself that I made. Um, yeah, the Warriors is on that list. The streets of Fire, because people say I'm obsessed with it, and I should be. Uh, that, that'll that be on that list. And um, do, 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 do. Southern Comfort, I think, will be on that list, too. Again, all, all, early, all early ones. Not just the old, the, the, the old ones. I mean, the newer ones, but the old ones are, uh, yeah, we're, you think we're going to come early or something on this, this shit, because we're talking about the old ones first. We're going to talk about it in order, but, yeah, the old ones are, like I said, hell of a run first coming out. And, uh, yeah, I guess, um, the first um, thing we should do is give you a little insight on uh, the subject of this this program. Um, Walter Hill was born in Long Beach, California, uh, the youngest of two sons. Uh, his his father and his grandfather were both pretty much blue collar. His his grandfather was an oil oil oil, oil driller. Can't even speak today. <laughs> and um, dad worked on on, on an aircraft assembly line. So he they're both blue collar and um, great physical guys. But uh, he chose to go another way, you know, by by living in Southern California. You know, he was um, as mad as a child. So I guess he he stayed inside a lot thinking about stuff, which has uh, only benefited us at this point. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, as a child, he didn't like a lot of cartoon films. He, he enjoyed the Western, which, you know, we'll, we'll see throughout his entire career. Because if you look, if you look into the writing about him, he wanted to make all his films like a Western have like a yeah. Western tinge to them. Like, uh, like John Carpenter in a way where all he, all John Carpenter wanted to do was make Westerns, but he came up in a, in a period where Westerns were out of uh, favor, you know? So it's like, uh, even if you're a director or some clout, it's like studios don't really want to touch a Western so much. So you got to kind of make your other movies look like Westerns. John Carpenter didn't really do that so much except for a couple of his films, but, um, Walter Hill, Pretty much everything he does is, is a Western in, in some sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Can't, can't I, I made like an, Ghost of Mars, people. Go ahead. I was going to say, I made one note, <clears throat> one notation here on my page and a half of notes I made to watch in the movie. It was <clears throat> Hard Times. It's it's a it's a Western, but the gunslingers use their fists. That's basically what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Broken down. <laughs> yeah. Um, you still can't give us your rewatch Ghost of Mars again. I've tried a few times, and... People say that's like a western. I just, I just can't. I'm not feeling it, John Carpenter. Just uh, well, well, I mean, you could always just like watch vampires instead. Well, this is true. You have cocky um, James Woods in that movie, or Escape from New York. <laughs> if, you, if you don't want to, if you if you don't want to go, if you don't want to go like uh, later day Carpenter, if you want to steer away from that shit, then you can always go Escape from New York. Oh, vampires is hackney as fuck, but the dialogue is just real loose. Because look who you're looking at. You're looking at James Woods and. Mm-hmm. I, I do I do like it though. Yeah, I do like because it. the bad the bad guy cuts another guy in half with his hand, I and mean, that's <laughs> kind of badass, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know what? Get out of my way, Mark Boo Junior. You piece of shit. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Back to this stuff though. Oh my god. Here we go. He, he uh, I don't know how you do this when you're an asthmatic, but they said during one summer he ran a asbestos pipe cutting machine and worked as a spray painter. Ooh. So I guess he got over that asthmatic stuff real fast. Yeah. <laughs> um, as a teenager, he he uh, contemplated being a comic book illustrator and studied in Mexico City. Uh, Mexico was as far away as I can get without any money, he says. So I guess he, he went to school real cheap there. Uh, um, after that, he went to Michigan State, where he uh, became a big fan of Hemingway, Hemingway's writing and... Yeah, I quote, the hardest thing to do is to write clearly and simply and make your point in an elegant way. Um, after that, was called into the Army, but ruled unfit because of his after the pipe cutting machine and spray painting business he was into. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, I guess he, he liked out there. He, he didn't go to the NAM with the rest of them, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, getting to the, to, to the good stuff now. Um, he, he worked on... Uh, a lot of old, a lot, a lot of um, a lot of old Western TV shows that everybody knows: uh, Gunsmoke, Wild Wild West, Bonanza, and Warning Shot. As an assistant director, um, did a lot of shows for a few weeks because you know back in those days they had about sixty Western shows on TV at any given time. 
So I'd imagine that they were a lot of workmen for hire doing those shows. So who it's, knows? He, he, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, it's, it's that era that you see uh, portrayed in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, where, you know, Every every show, like just at the tail end of the like the the sixties, every show on, on TV is pretty much a western or like uh, FBI or, or some sort of like action macho uh, dude kind of show. Yeah, for sure, man. And um, yeah, it's portrayed there, but that's the end of that that whole the di- the di- the dying of the western, as you said. Mm-hmm. But it's re it's rebirth in those Italian pictures, as he says in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The Italians. Yeah. Uh, I've seen enough. But uh, he, he later to later will work on you know such films as Thomas Crown Affair as, as an assistant director and uh, uncredited uh, second assistant director on Bullet. So he worked with some pretty heavy hitters. And then later with Woody Allen, Take the Money and Run. Uh, what does he say here? Uh, he also worked as first assistant director on some television advertisements. He said no desire to work in those areas, but I guess it was a steady paycheck or something, you know. But mm-hmm. they didn't want it long, long term. They get into the the goodies that we're, which we'll talk about. I think we're gonna do this is like um because these are some decent flicks to do for for like a Patreon thing. He uh, his first writing credit was Hickey and Boggs, which starred Bill Cosby and Robert Culp. It's like a like a buddy cop kind of movie, yeah. like the first one, first one of those kinds, really. Uh, they will later go on to star in I Spy, of course. At- See this? If they're pretty sure it's after that. This is 1972. Mm. I think that was afterwards, wasn't it? Yeah. Wasn't it I think so. Yeah. Not, yeah, not, I'm, I'm not big on the. Uh, if I'm wrong, the, tell me so. <laughs> the Cosby. I'm not. I'm not big on the career of Bill Cosby, nor do I want to like dig into it anymore. Like at this point. <laughs> right. You know. You, you don't want to talk about Ghost Dad and how good it was back in the day. Come on now. I'd rather talk about Leonard's part six at this point. Holy shit. Well, don't do it, man. It's like pre it's like pre Pluto Nash. <laughs> God. <laughs> oh, Pluto Nash, goddamn. It doesn't deserve the hate, goddamn it. No, I'll play it. Hey, I, I do I've watched it once and maybe four times. I don't know. It's a it was on cable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I never could finish watching that movie. Never, I started it like like three or four times. Never could finish it. Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> He, he uh, went on to work with, with Peter Bogdanovich uh, early on. See, guys, it's crazy. He went on The Getaway, he wrote that. Um, yep. Worked the script together while Bogdanovich was working on What's Up, Doc? What, what else we got here? Worked with Peck and Paw. Yeah, well, that would be The Getaway. That would too. be The Getaway as well, yeah. Some of Peck bought for a time, seeing Peck bought might write direct Lloyd Williams, but he decided to direct Pat Williams and Pat, Pat Williams, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. And uh, instead, The Thief Who Came to Dinner eventually came out. Hill later said, Warren Oates is good in the movie, better than the movie was. They cut a lot of things out of the movie they shouldn't have. Well, that happens when you're a young director and you don't have creative control over your own shit. It even happens today. Um, mm. it's, and, pretty, uh, it's pretty ironic, though, given oh, sorry. Uh, given the way his career went after he actually started uh, helming films, like talking about things being cut out, where he's kind of like known for meticulously like cutting his films and like not releasing like director's cuts or anything like that. Like the one we're going to be talking about tonight, there's like the original cut was like two hours long. Yeah. And yeah. There's, there's, there's just a half hour that's gone and nobody's seen. So there's, there's two whole fights. Uh, I, I think I remember reading somewhere that yeah. got cut and it feels like it when we don't know watching it and revisiting it here again, it, it feels like there's a lull in the middle. Like, there's some, mm-hmm. There was something else here, you know. There was some of him building himself up in the underground. It felt like there should have been more fights. Right. In the 80s, there would have been a montage, see? He did uh, <laughs> multiple fights. <laughs> Gotta have a montage. Even Rocky had a montage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. And then, of course, later, the, the, the one you all know listening to this program, this, this program see, uh, was Alien. He, uh, his, he set up his production company, Brandywine Productions. Uh, developed produced films. Uh, script of Alien came to him. He optioned and rewrote with his partner David Geiler. Not credited for the writing work, of course. Hill decided not to direct the film, but it became a massive hit. So I'd imagine he got paid something. For- I think he's still cashing checks on that fucking franchise at this definitely, point. Definitely, definitely. Right? Yeah, he's still cashing those uh, Aliens checks for sure. But um, it's a shame it wasn't a bigger part of it. I, I'm not saying Alien's a bad movie. I love Alien. You know, I, w- I would love to see the the Walter Hill uh, script 
his original script, I'm sure it exists somewhere. I'm going I'm to look for it. You know? It'd be the one where Ripley doesn't say anything. Oh, no, don't do that. At, just looks at people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. And, um, yeah, the 70s, of course, he wanted to direct um, his own film. So he, he met Lawrence Gordon in 73. I, I think, um, I forget how he met him. But basically, he, he uh, agreed to let Hill direct a film. If he wrote the screenplay for him, Hill made his deal and to, to write and direct to, for scale and in turn of getting a shot directing because sometimes you got to work you know for free mm-hmm. to get your, your nose out there and uh this is how hard times happened um which uh was shot in new orleans on location for 2.7 billion dollars and in under 40 days uh just got a great starring cast for for a first time director if uh you got charles bronson and, and this a uh, 52 year old charles bronson they mm. wanted somebody much younger for this role, but um, very, very gruff dude gets what he wants, I guess, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, I mean, he, uh, like, Bronson's a big star at this point, right, though? Because, like, he he went to Europe, and he made the um, Farewell Friend with Alan De- Delon, and that made him a big mega star. Then he went on to do Once Upon a Time in the West and a couple other films in Europe, and then he came back to the U.S. with, like, big box office clout. And started like getting first bill, you know, becoming the star of all these films. And like this is, this is like Bronson's peak period. Like Bronson peaked in his fifties, which is kind of unheard of for actors right. at this point, right? And like you look at Bronson, and I mean he's got the face of a fifty-two-year-old, but he's got like the body of a twenty-five-year-old, and he's just like fucking just gangbusters. Oh yeah, built like a brick wall, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, this was done the his, same within the same like year within a year or so, of, like Death Wish and Breakout, mm-hmm. you know. So I mean, like he was rocking it at that point. Yeah, I'll, I'll say one thing about his boxing style: his his footworks. He said left be left to be desired, but that's a that's a tactical thing for fighters, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Which I'm sure you know a lot of the professional fighters that they got for this movie. We only got to see a couple of them, of course, had him in fights, but uh, I'm sure they were they had to be kind of insulted by. Letting this guy who's walking like Frankenstein knock him on their ass a little bit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's Charles Bronson, you know, I mean, even, you know, like, who wouldn't be like, hey, you know, it's, you know, fucking Charles Bronson, let it, let him knock me out of my ass. That's that's something to, to brag about. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he plays Cheney, who's like a, literally like a, a, a traveler he, he, uh, on a train. He, he comes in, he's a stowaway yeah. on the train, of course, comes to town. I mean, um, it just back. goes back to the to the Western thing. I mean, he, he is just a man with no name, basically, gunfighter who do, just drives into this town looking to make some money to get him to the next town. Like, he, there's no backstory on him or anything like that. He's just totally that sort of archetype, that, like, Clint Eastwood man with no name kind of thing. Yep. But he uh, he finds his way, of course. He, 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 um, he runs a fall of speed, played by James Coburn, who's a... Uh, a promoter slash hustler slash 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 uh not the money guy that that's that's our friend Poe which is Schroeder Martin and um he uh convinces well, well Charles Brown it's, it's kind of mutual I think in the movie <laughs> they convince each other to trust each other to go and get a good hustle and, and him to go knock some people on their asses because if you heard the if you hear the trailer you know what do you do I knock guys down and that's all he <laughs> does you know <laughs> Yeah, I love that line. I love that design. I just knock guys down. That, yeah. That's very simple. <laughs> oh, man. He's not a guy you have there to beat the spread, though, because he uh, literally, it's like watching Tyson do his thing. And I'd imagine it needed to be quick because Bronson's footwork was so terrible. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out. I'll throw it out there all day long. I've watched enough fights to, to watch this Frankenstein guy walk around the thing. And that's fine, though. Um, Jill Ireland is also in this film. I forget if she's married to him at this point. I think she is at this point, and this is. Well, well I'll, I'll I'll put a pin on that. I I'll, I want to talk about Jill Ireland and uh, Bronson here and sort of their career or whatever. But I'll, I'll put a pin on that for now because that's going to be that's going to be one of my criticisms of the film. And that's fine. Yeah, she plays like a, she plays Lucy Simpson, who becomes. His squeeze of sorts, his sort of girlfriend, but he doesn't want to be with her at the same time because she's kind of, I don't even know. You don't know what he wants in this movie in that sense. But um, <laughs> but he gets really upset when she rejects him for that. And that uh, 
that's just a dude thing to do, I guess. <laughs> it was back in the seventies, at least. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so you know what? I I love you, but I don't want to be around you. Get out of here, woman. Right, right. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, you were just in death wish. Yeah, and raped. I don't care what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else we got here? Yeah, uh, casting. Uh, originally wanted to to get a younger actor like J- like a J- like a J. Michael Vincent. And he wanted Warren Oates to play Coburn's role. Uh, according to Hill, they offered him offered it to a couple actors, and they didn't want to do it. Then it was said to Charles Bronson, even though Hill thought he was too old. A day later, Bronson's agent called back and said, Bronson had read the script and wanted to do the film, but had to meet me. He wanted to see how I measured up. Uh, younger guy, I guess. Uh, Hill remembers that Bronson was in remarkable physical condition for a guy his age. He was 52 at the time, had excellent co- coordination and a splendid build. Problem was that he was a smoker and didn't have... A lot of stuff. He probably could have kicked anybody's ass on that movie, but he didn't fight much longer than 30 or 40 seconds. Uh, like I said, it, the fights didn't last very long. Because yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, to, to be honest, you know, I, I totally buy that Bronson was a legit tough guy in real life. And if he knew how to fight, he probably could end most fights in about 30 to 40 seconds if he was fighting somebody who wasn't trained, right? You know, so. Right. Somebody that d- didn't have footwork. Mm hmm. But yeah, yeah, I wouldn't want to get punched in those in the face with those big ham hock sized fists of his. I wouldn't want to take a punch from Bronson. Not 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 at this point in his life. No, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to fucking hit his jaw. I'd be afraid my knuckles would break on that fucking shit. <laughs> right? <laughs> be like punching a brick. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, James Coburn or Strother Martin they didn't really get along with Walter Hill because uh, James Coburn was a little upset that he was playing second fiddle to Bronson in a way, and he thought he was a bigger star. So it's kind of like a George Papard, Mr. T thing on the A-team. I've heard <laughs> stories about that, that oh, Papard yeah. hated Mr. T. For, he didn't hate him, but he, he resented him a bit because he was a established actor playing opposite of this, you know, nice guy. I mean, he, he's got he's a, a, a lot of accomplished, but basically a... a, a um, a parody, if you will, of uh, a character. Mm. Um, I, I was, yeah. <laughs> Get that Mr. T grunts in there, baby, do it. But, um, <laughs> but I, you, you can get that, right? Because, you know, Coburn, up to this point, was a big fucking star. and But it just so happened that his career was kind of winding down a little bit at this point compared to Bronson, who we already said is like this is his peak period like he's skyrocketing here in like the early 70s like he's just everything he's cranking out pretty much is a fucking hit and Coburn hadn't really had anything big in the last couple of years necessarily like he was kind of kind of like plateauing a little bit and so and like they they'd done two pitchers together before at this point too um where Coburn was the bigger star, like bigger, like higher build than Bronson was. Yeah, I think Coburn took it as a slight, yeah, you know, to his ego. Just like, why am I playing second fiddle to Bronson? But you know, sometimes you know, you just got to remember there are no small parts. Mm-hmm. Especially and, in this film, because everybody fucking shines in their own. Oh world. yeah, it's it's a it's a very much an ensemble piece in a way. Even though there's like not necessarily like a a lot of like background character shit and dialogue and stuff like that, but everybody's like kind of giving their all in this film. Yeah, and James Coburn, like, let's face it, he's the MVP here. Like he's the shining, <clears throat> you know. He's not the star of the movie, but he he's the the character I remember the most. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he shines in this movie. He's this, he's got a smile like a Cheshire cat, and you know, he just you always know he's up to something. Cheshire Cat or a fucking Great White Shark, one or the other. <laughs> yeah, depending on which angle they use, right? Yeah. <laughs> that bottom lip kind of drooped like a guppy a little bit sometimes. There's certain things. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, about the fights, though, Hill said the fights were dances. That's why there's no blood. People comment that the fights are great, but they would have been better if you put some blood in them. What they don't realize is that as soon as you put blood in those fights, they would have been gotten so real, they would have lost their dramatic truth. Um, yeah, all 40 seconds of them, but that, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, because when you watch the film, there, there wasn't no music playing. It was just two guys who, who were going to, you know, go at it. <laughs> I although, thought that was kind of nice. Although, I mean, talking about the fights here. So, like, the rest of this film is not shot with any sort of, like, flourish. Like, it's very... 
uh, just like dialed back. There's no big camera moves. There's no big zooms or anything like that. But once you get to the fights, you get these like, you know, overhead shots establishing like the entire space. And then you get like some pretty good camera work, like just showing the fights going on. And it, it becomes like pretty kinetic, like really good action stuff. And like every fight kind of builds. I, I really like like the the logic behind every fight, even though and you're right, Gary, Bronson's footwork is just total bullshit. Like it's non existent. But uh there's a story being told with the fights as they build along where Bronson is he's watching each potential, you know, future opponent that he's gonna walk into. He's watching how they fight and learning how they fight so he can just like walk all over them when he actually pairs up against them. And when we get to the final fight, which uh, all this time it's been building to bigger and bigger fights. And then it goes down to this much more intimate, like just one on one fight with a very small crowd. He has never seen this guy fight before. So he actually has to learn during the fight how to fight this guy. And uh, I, I think, you know, there's there's a real good like of economy of storytelling here that Walter Hill does that um, just really sort of jumps out of the screen when when it happens. Yeah, it's very low key st- storytelling. It's all like very, very mm-hmm. subliminal. You know, you're you're watching along with Bronson as, you know, as Cheney as just watching and learning. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. No, the release. Um, um, he claims it was profitable. In 2009, he was still getting money from it. His best deal ever made, he claimed he got a career out of it, which is understandable. Picture was well-received by, by critics, and it made a whole lot of money and got him off and going. So it's, you got to get that going on, guys, because I mean, he didn't get paid technically for making the movie. But, you know, the back end is uh, an embarrassment of riches <laughs> after this <laughs> took off, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think, the, I think the total box office, at least the figure I saw on Wikipedia, was like 26.5. And, like, I think there's even, like, additional, like, um, rental sort of back end on that as well that, that's probably even even bigger. So, like, this this movie did really good financially, and it just did fucking gangbusters to, like, make him a name that people were going to, like, throw money at him to make films in the future kind of thing. So I mean, look at who you got, though. You had draws in the cast that were going to bring people, and he, he was fortunate enough to have... You know, Lawrence Gordon, who was, at this point, a pretty big Hollywood producer. This was the year, the, the year a lot of stuff for him come out. And, um, yeah, and um, the, yeah, all, all the established actors and all this good stuff. I mean, it was going to be, I'm not saying everything's destined to be a hit, because nowadays we know that ain't fucking true. But, you know, for the 70s, for the people that are in it, I think uh, he was poised to uh, be, be awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, like, with a cast like this and a story like this and stuff, like, if anyone was going to drop the ball, it probably would be the director. And he <laughs> right. So, yeah. But, um, man, let's get in the movie now, uh, all the way. Uh, I'll kick it to Cameron first and ask him, uh, what's your thoughts on, on hard times here, buddy? You know, I hadn't watched it in a couple of years. It's, it's probably been five, six years since I watched this and just rewatched it in the last two days here. It's still an amazing movie. It holds up so well. It it is a modern day western. I mean, not modern day. It's, you know, it took place in the seven or filmed in the seventies. Took place in what those the dates nineteen thirty three. It it aged so well. Uh, I mean, it's it's you know I think a lot of people today would probably consider it slow to be slow storytelling, but I just think it is just slowly building and just watching everybody work. When you got people like Bruce Glover. Struther Martin working in there with James Coburn and Bronson being like low key seconds to them. It's so great. It's acted so well. The fight scenes are brutal. I think playing them off of like they do silent with no music and, and very little flair, this makes them that much more brutal. If I had any issue with the movie, I think Lee already touched base on this. It would be the, the Jill Ireland uh, angle. Uh, it, it really feels unnecessary, and really, in the end, you could have cut her character and that entire subplot out of the movie entirely, and left in those other fights that got cut out, and that you know <laughs> that are on the cutting room floor, and it would have been much better. But what a fucking first feature! I mean, think about it. As young as he was back then, 
getting his first, you know, directing gig. What the hell? I mean, what a great feature to, to, to come out of the gate with. And, you know, I, I think really, though, I mean, as much as I love Bronson, I'm a huge, huge Bronson fan. I actually contemplated doing a solo uh, uh, Bronson podcast. But uh, James Coburn's the MVP here. I've already said that once. His character is speed. He's colorful. He's a shyster, you know. He's he's a, he's just a, a liar, a cheat, and a thief, you know. And he's robbing from Peter to pay Paul. <laughs> and he's getting himself in deep trouble, which was how we get the final fight that we get between uh, uh, Cheney and what's his name, Street, played by Nick uh, Dimitri. Mm. Or, or uh, no, that wasn't. Uh, yeah, it was Dimitri, wasn't it? I so, think it was. Yeah, was it? Dimitri? Yeah, I think it was. But uh, yeah, it's it's great. I love it. You know, I don't. Are we doing a rating system here? Or are we doing that saving that for the end? Yeah, I'd say we just like recommend it at the, at the end when everybody's done talking. You know, I'm sure it'd be a lot of recommends on here but you know what's the point of writing them if, if they're you know enjoyable <laughs> oh yeah I, well, yeah i think you already know i would recommend it <laughs> yeah and some like i said again some of the, the you know the supporting characters the fighters like bruce like i said uh bruce glover is doty is great robert tessier is jim henry is great frank mcgray is a uh, hammer man <laughs> you know just great and i think the location plays well into the movie, you know, like New Orleans in the 30s was pretty much the the wild, wild west. So, yeah, again, uh, to find, you know, to finish off my little mini review here, it it's, it's very much a modern day western where the, the gunslingers just use uh, fists instead of guns. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I have to add this, you know, because <laughs> I'm looking down the list here. And uh, two of my favorite character actors show up in this movie. And I have to look for them now because they're like small, like spectators or whatnot. MC Ganey shows up, and so does Brian James. So now I have to watch the film. I was see looking to actually see the show for the. Oh, I'm sorry, I did not. I did not see him. Not, like I, I, I didn't realize Brian James was in this, and I was actually actively looking for him this time, and I still didn't see him. So I must have. I, I didn't see him either. I yeah. looked for him. He might be on the cutting room floor with those fights. Uh, he, he's either in that, or I mean, maybe it's just like a, a call to his future part in uh, Southern Comfort, where he's one of the Cajuns in the crowd somewhere, kind of thing. That's that's the dream, right, Lee? Just to just uh, connect all this stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Six degrees uh, of Walter Hill. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's that's the joy of torches. See, it's 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 everywhere. I think in the in the next film is our first torchy sighting. So I'm kind of excited. Um. I'll kick it to Lee next. Lee, uh, your thoughts, sir? I love this one. I mean, I I can go back and watch this at any time, especially when I'm just like hankering for a movie about, you know, tough guys doing tough guy shit. And like people who have like Bronson's character in this, he has a moral center. Like he, he is true to himself throughout the entire film. And even though uh, Coburn's character of speed just like um fucking just double crosses him and treats him like shit at times at the end of the day he's like you know what even though i i've said that i'm in this just for the money i actually have the moral backbone where i can't let a guy die on an account of me not showing up to a fight and he likes cats so what's you know what's yeah not to like about the I mean, guy? He, he, he's a good guy all around um, and he's he's just a tough motherfucker. He's a smart motherfucker who, like we said, you know, he's watching the fights. He's watching his opponents. He's learning what they do. Like he's looking at the bald guy, basically like, oh, this guy likes putting his head down and having people break their knuckles on his head. So he's going to fucking work around that. He's going to dance around the guy and he's going to throw like like that that move Bronson does where he throws like four or five fucking really quick jabs from both hands and and just clobbers the guy in the face and just sort of like works him around the cage and stuff i love how these fill these uh fights build where even though yeah again bronson's footwork is total garbage but you see his character every opponent he has he treats him different the first guy he fights he's just like this guy's a big blowhard i'm just gonna like straight up walk into him and and knock him the fuck out and <laughs> love that <laughs> Cajun guy, he sees, okay, this guy, he's probably got no fucking cardio at all. I'm just going to blow him up. I'm going to punch him in the fucking gut until he can't move anymore, and then I'm just going to lay him out. And he does that. So it's really good. And then in the final fight, 
he actually has to learn the opponent on the fly. And like the, the final guy he's fighting is kind of like physically pretty much his match. Like they're pretty much equal in size and stature and everything. And he's just got to tough it out and fight the guy. And, and he does it like he proves that he not only can, you know, research an opponent and, and like find out their weaknesses, he can do it on the fly as well. It's just a tough motherfucker. And I mean, the interplay between him and, and Coburn, um, Strother Barton is sort of the in-between guy between those two when they're not, when they're on the outs it is great. Strother Martin just, just having a fucking ball, man. Like he, he he's, he's this opium addicted fucking guy wearing a big white suit, like a Southern fucking white suit. You know, the heat must be oppressive as, as shit. So he's wearing a white suit instead <laughs> of a black suit. And he, he does all these like little aside looks and stuff where like you buy. Yeah. This is a guy who's a fucking junkie. Like he, he, he makes weird looks to the side and, and looking away from the camera and stuff where he just like, I buy that guy as a fucking junkie. Uh, and and what kind of job, you know, like uh, Strother Martin is the cut man and the, <laughs> there's only one cut he ever has to attend to in the entire fucking film. That's the <laughs> He's last got an one. easy job, don't he? <laughs> yeah. He, and he never has to stitch Bronson up. He just has to like wipe a little bit of blood away at the end at this point, you know. So, I mean, it, it's it's great. And I mean, he's just this sort of smooth talking uh, guy who quotes poetry and uh, just weirds out any girlfriend he can find. Basically, uh, I love it. Um, but yeah, no, everything on this pretty much works except for Jill Ireland. And here's the thing. Okay, I get it. Bronson is with Jill Ireland. He wants her in all of his movies. Here's where his nepotism sort of gets in the way of his film output because everybody could see that Jill Ireland just isn't that good of an actress she's okay but she's not like good and that was always sort of like going forward that was sort of the like the the problem people would be like you know what jill ireland ain't all that good you know directors and actors and stuff like basically you know giving her a hard time or like trying to get stuff out of her that she just couldn't give and bronson button heads with people on productions because Hey, Pali, you talking to my woman like that? And, I mean, Walter Hill was no different. Uh, because Walter Hill did not think too much of Jill Ireland's performance, uh, he never worked with Bronson again, although he wanted to. Bronson basically told him no. And and it, that was the end of it, basically. Um, and I think that was sort of one big blind spot in, in Bronson's sort of filmmaking, you know, career where he put her ahead of what he was doing. And I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to shit on Jill Ireland. I mean, uh, she's perfectly fine as an actress. She's just not great. And she doesn't quite fit in a lot of this stuff. Like, um, she's also like the weakest link in a uh, violent city from a couple years earlier or like, yeah, a couple years earlier. And she kind of drags that film down a little bit as well. Um, but, you know, it's his woman. He was going to do what he was going to do. Bronson was a tough guy. No one was going to tell him no. No one was going to tell him what the fuck to do. If anyone gave him any flack, he basically said, fuck off. And he just went to make another movie with somebody else. So um, that's what it is. But um, yeah, other than that, like this, this film's great. Uh, I mean, to come out of the gates with something this good and the fact that once we get into it in future episodes, Walter Hill actually follows up and even tops this. Yeah, great stuff. Great stuff. Yeah, it became a trend. It's still a trend today of uh, forcing your your woman into your your films. And mm-hmm. Issa was like that with Sandra Locke, who's she, she's okay in some things, especially when it's minimal. But yeah, he forced her into films and basically fucked her out of a career that she wasn't that good to begin with. You know, right. you know but um, uh, who else? Spielberg with, with uh, Kate Capshaw, of course, and Temple of Doom. We all love. All love her, I guess. You know, as a kid, it was my favorite, but not so much now. Temple of Doom. Um, of course, today, you know, a couple days ago, we got the news that our friend Rob Zombie's doing a monstrous film. Guess who's going to play Lily Monster? I have a, I have a feeling, mm-hmm. I, deep down in my the deepest dank part of my ball sack, that 
oh, yeah. Cherry Moon, that that hack that hackney bitch is going to play uh, little Lily Munster. I got a feeling, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, she she is Rob, uh, Rob to Rob Zombie what Jill Ireland was to Bronson, hands down. <laughs> Yeah, but she she did kill one of the best rock and roll bands of the nineteen nineties. I'm, I'm just gonna say that out out, out right there. Um, <laughs> so sorry, Sherry. I'm not I'm not a fan. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the film itself. I, I love films like this. You know, where the, you you and this one's it, it's there, but like the art of the hustle in a way because you got Speed, who's like this this man about the street who's always looking for an angle, always looking for uh, a, a new bet, always looking for a sure thing. And he finds that in Cheney who's this guy who pretty much keeps it honest with him the whole movie. Mm-hmm. He, he never really, that's the kind of love about the character. He never really like hides who he's going to be or what he's going to do. Even, even when he's down, he, he's right there with him. So, so, so what's next? You know, I, I have, I have X amount of dollars in my pocket, but I can care less. You know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to be me. I'm just going to be Chaney. And it's like, I love about the character. Uh, whereas Speed was was constantly being a desperate dude, and he, he seemed to have money most to most people, and always trying to get that 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 buy in for for Cheney's next fight. And like yeah. I said, Poe, who's this uh this this hyperactive dude, this Rose Martin character, who's full of energy, and uh, of course cr- crashes. I, I forget the name of his girl in the movie, but she she had more spark than than Jill Ireland did in this movie. <laughs> oh, without a doubt. Um, yeah, which is which is wrong. You see, you see a lot less of her. It, it feels like like the script should have been more like Coburn's fiance, quote unquote, would be like interested in Bronson, and there'd be like some sort of tension there. I mean, if if you wanted to go, you know, typical like love romance thing, it feels like that would be more apropos instead of Joe Ireland, which is kind of just like a a void in this film, like just kind of a every time she shows up, nothing's really happening. Because he he does she does resent him because you could tell you know, after they got the big payday after Bronson went and got the money which is one of the best scenes in the film where mm-hmm. he but he after they they stiff him out of the money for the fight they find the bar where they, that the guy owns and Bronson just shows up like he's, he's by himself but you know I'll take out all your gunmen all at once mm-hmm. and <laughs> yeah of course love that scene best scene yeah, in the movie he gets the money and. He of course pisses it away right away, to much to the chagrin of his of his lady friend, who you know, it's yeah. like you lost it all, uh, didn't you, or something like that. She says, "It's uh," and he's just I like, that. "Shut up, <laughs> shut up, woman." You know, uh, what do you Co- what do you know? <laughs> Coburn's just like a degenerate gambler. That's the thing, right? It's like he can never get ahead because he's oh, owed yeah. his money on the next fucking bet. So, um. I love that Frank McRae shows up in this movie. He'll show up in future Walter Hill pictures and. Many other pictures as well. If you don't know who he is, and you've seen 48, 48 Hours, he plays the captain in that movie. He plays the police captain, the last action hero. He's in lockup with Sylvester Stallone, a pretty good character in that movie. He's in, he's in many, many things. Uh, he, pa- he passed away just recently. Too. Just recently. It made me very sad because I've seen him in so many things. Mm. Yeah, first like, thing, first like thing, two months ago, barely. Right around there, yeah. First thing I seen him in was The Wizard with Fred Savage. I watch that a lot, and he, <laughs> fucking wizard. He plays their, their their truck their truck tr- truck driver friend in that movie, and um, okay. yeah, this one though, like I said, the the, the fights aren't top notch. If you look for like for like Rocky, you're you're not gonna get it because they literally last like as long as the Tyson fight lasts. Because like I said, we said Bronson's footwork is terrible, so he has to go out there throw throw the punches, you know, hit the haymakers, and although I mean he is, when, he's gonna win. Yeah, I'm although sorry. when when you think about it, like they're they're presented more as like realistic fights. Like if if you look at this compared to like something like Rocky, Rocky's total bullshit. Like th- those fights are just super like uh, hyperbole personified oh. screen kind of right. Right. Like here, oh. Walter. I, Hill- I'm, not, I'm not trying to compare the two two kinds of fights. I'm just saying if you're looking for Rocky, you're not really going to find that here. No, 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 no. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say like this is a better. I think this is a better sports film than Rocky is. Honestly. In a, in a way, yeah, I I I, I agree and disagree. <laughs> I love the Rocky. I love I love the Rocky sequels more than the original Rocky, but that, that's that's my own personal taste. Um, yeah, Bronson's great in the movie. Like I said, he's he's a lot. He's really subdued in this movie, and that's the kind of Bronson I like in the movies. And I love I love the the wild ones. Everybody loves Ten to Midnight stuff like that. But when you get like this subdued, 
sort of humble Bronson, it, it starts to really show, you know, what kind of character he can be. And it works really well in this movie. Um, the other actors speak for themselves. Like he, he's, he's a legend at this point. I mean, he's like not really a big legend at this point, but the other guys are, so you get good guys to work with and it, yeah. it really brings out your, it flourishes your performance. And I think it really works to his detriment and it works to, uh, our young director's detriment. And I, I think the film is all that much better for it. Um, didn't talk about the score. It's uh, done by Barry Devorzen, who would later go into many scores, including Walter Hill's The Warriors. Um, it's it's got a nice twang to it. You would think it was Ry Cooter, who we get a lot of scores from later on in Walter Hill films, yeah. but you know th- this twang belongs to Barry Devorzen, who who gave us uh, that wonderful Warriors score as well. And mm. they they, and they it, couldn't be they couldn't be more different. The scores. And then you got like just like a lot of uh, sort of like diegetic like movie uh, music going on as well, where, you know, oh, yeah. you, got, you got some street performers at some point, like, and then you have a, uh, you have a uh, church gospel choir, and then you have like a jazz band doing it at some point in a club or whatever. And so like, it, it just, it just builds like the authentic, like this, even if you don't know what New or- Orleans is or whatever, Louisiana, it feels like it to you like it sells it enough to some like like yeah this is authentic i'll go with it you know right, kind of right yeah and, and they were credited too the greater liberty baptist church choir and congregation were credited in the movie so mm-hmm. there you go good, good good job walter hill on you good on you um there's plenty more to say about this film but I'm, i want you guys to watch it I'll, I'll talk about the releases now of the film there, there is a dvd uh, a u.s dvd that came out which is kind of bare bones uh, there's a second site, Blu-ray, that is non-existent now because it's so out of print. It's not even funny. Uh, the one I got picked up recently, um, which is the Eureka, it's a UK company um, version of the film. It's got a new 4K scan. It's got interviews with Lawrence Gordon and, and Walter Hill and Barry Devorzan on there. No, no, no commentary to speak of, which I, I don't know what it is about him and like Joe Dante. They put commentaries on their Blu-rays, and now they don't like doing them or what. It is, but like almost every Joe Dante disc got picked up. I'm looking for a commentary that doesn't exist. Yeah, Joe, <laughs> yeah. Dante, Joe Dante loves talking about other fucking movies, just not his own. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it's so weird. I like. I want to hear about some stories from the burbs. Like not existed. I was, I was, okay, that's fine. You know. Yeah. It's like, can we get a commentary on Gremlins? No, I guess we're not going to get it. Because mm. if you listen to his show, the the movies that maybe which you guys all should be listening to. Um, Josh Olson does the majority of the talking on the show, and Joe's there, but he's kind of like a background person, really. <laughs> um, this film, though, I, I, uh, oh yeah, in digital formats is everywhere. It's, it's everywhere in those digital formats. Um, I, I, I think I give it a high recommendation. I mean, for for coming out of the gate, 1975, you know, films like this were were, were many of them were being made like this, and this one stands out for me. You know, amongst your McCabe and Mrs. Miller's and stuff like that. Um, right. Uh, check it out. Do you guys agree? Oh yeah. I oh, mean, this oh is, yeah, hundred percent. This is one of like, and Bronson made so many great films within this period, but this is at the top. Like, this is near the top of of all of his like really great seventies output. Like this, this is better than Death Wish, as far as I'm concerned. This is this is really high up there. So I mean. Like, and then, you know, if you're a Bronson fan or if you're not and you want to get into him, this is another one. This is a good one to get into him with because he's just so watchable and likable. And despite the fact he doesn't say dick all in the film, like he, I think he's got less than 500 words or something like that in the entire script or everything. But, uh, yeah. yeah hey, man, man, a few words, but, but you know, it, it, he lets us best do the talking. Mm-hmm. Oh, and yeah, for sipping it later, I think. What's the part of time in the West come after this? No, it was before this. He he yeah, made again, yeah, he's, he's, yeah like he made that was, he, that was, that was 68, so sixty eight. So seven years yeah. before this. So look at that. Look at that. Cast. Yeah, like he like he 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 literally became a star at like age fifty, and this is like into like you know his run as a big star. Like we're a couple years into it now, kind of thing. So you know. But yeah, in this like one or two year period, you know, he had like what a half dozen or more films. He did like a Breakheart Pass, Breakout, Death mm-hmm. Wish, Mr. Majestic, Chino, <laughs> The Stone Killer. Probably, 
Yeah, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm probably missing a few, you know, I mean, but... He did so many. There's so many, you know, I mean, just in that couple, one to two year period, like, just hit after hit, big film after big film. Yeah. And to He's think that, like, he didn't, you know, even become, like, you know, an actor or what until he was, like, really, like, about, what, 35? <laughs> yeah. Earlier thing I've probably seen him in was the Twilight Zone episode he was in with Elizabeth Montgomery. Montgomery, which is basically a silent episode with music. There's like a few couple words said. It's called two. If you haven't seen it before, uh, there are yeah. two people. Yeah, they have two people. He he was a soldier. She was not a soldier. They meet up in like a post-apocalyptic world where there's nobody around but those two people, and it's just a nice character study. If you haven't watched that episode, I'd uh, I'd recommend it to go check mm-hmm. out the episode two. I think it's called two. Yeah, I forget which season it's in. Maybe three. Or yeah, probably around three or a season five. I forget. You have to look it up. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'll recommend this here. Um, next episode that we will be doing will be da, 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 the driver, uh, mm-hmm. starring Ryan O'Neill, and of course the great Bruce Dern. And um, yeah, we'll have a lot to say about this one. I think. Yeah. Yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot of cars, a lot of visuals. A lot of uh, Ronnie Blakely's eyes on that movie, just staring at you. <laughs> and wouldn't um, that be the first uh, appearance of Torchies? First appearance of Torchies comes in the driver, so we'll be talking about that for about two seconds, because that's about all you see. You see the sign, so you, you know where they're <laughs> at, um, which is a nice it's a nice glowing sign. Uh, I'll uh, kick it to Cameron, Scott. You got a lot of stuff coming up. You said you did three shows today, sir. I, I commend yeah. you. But uh, Yeah, this is show number uh, three today. Some- Tell us, tell us all about it, sir. What you got coming uh, up? Well, I, I, I got so much coming up. I'm finishing up my Killer Wheels Appreciation Month, and we're doing things like Christine and Maximum Overdrive, the car, the hearse. We got two more episodes of that. I've been a little bit slack, and I've been recording so much and working so much that I haven't got a chance to edit. So I kind of carried that over. It was supposed to be just the month of May, but it's kind of carried over a few weeks in, into June. Uh, I've got the last few episodes of that. I've been working hard on my sequel to Deja Vu show. I've been recording episodes of that left and right. And um, I actually leave in a week and a half for uh, a film shoot that I'm uh, working on called Parallels. We're shooting in Indianapolis for like six days come the end of June. And then we're shooting another week on that in uh, Nashville, the second batch of filming on that in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So I'll be working hard on that for the next couple of weeks. But, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff. I did a guest spot on some on a podcast for a friend of mine called Rich Hall. Uh, the Rich Hall Hall Space podcast where we reviewed <laughs> Army of the Dead. And we had a lot of things to say about that one. That was a fun show. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, recording like a madman, releasing like a madman. And um, I'm actually working on a top, sort of top secret project. But I'll kind of let... A little bit of it out. It's going to be a fictionalized po- podcast, kind of done in the style of the old radio serials. Yeah. But um, it's in the planning There's stages. There's not enough of that, sir. I'm looking forward to that. There's not enough of that out there. Yeah, it's going to be a choose-your-own-adventure. I'm wow. going to do um, I'm I'm thinking about doing it every month, but since it's going to be such a big undertaking, it may be in every other month. It's going to be a choose-your-own-adventure uh, serial where at the at the end of every month, I'll put it to the fans and the people listening what they want to happen to these characters. And uh, all I'll say about it is a, a zombie drama. I know a lot of people are probably sick and tired of uh, z- zombies and whatnot, but I am not. I am a big fan of the undead, and you know, my love for the undead is not dead either. So, uh, But yeah, I've been working on that. I talked to a couple of actors today to lend uh, their voice talents and whatnot. And talking to a special effects, or, or not a special effects guy, but a sound effects guy to create all the ambient noise and whatnot. So it's a big undertaking, but it's something I've been planning for about six months. Just, but it just, may... don't, just don't go all Denny O'Neill on the people, okay? That guy took shit out till his fucking day he died about killing Robin. So <laughs> <laughs> I won't take it that far. I won't take it that far. In case you don't understand that reference, you know, back in the day, DC Comics did, did a story. In which you could decide if Robin lived or died, and you can call the number. And then this was the uh, a guy who was the editor of DC Comics at the time, Denny O'Neill. He made the decision to do this, so Robin lost, and to this day, he's the guy that killed Robin. Mm. Yeah, I remember Not the original about Robin, that. Jason J- J- Jason Todd Robin. You know, 
<laughs> yeah, you know, you know, it's worse than that though. The DC animated version of that they did a year ago or so, which is the worst fucking thing they released. Oh, just DC. watch, just watch the Red Hood one. Don't watch that one. You know, yeah. it, it, it's it's actually worse than the movie where you know, uh, uh, Batgirl uh, has a sexual relationship with Batman and then uh, gets uh, raped and paralyzed with the Joker. Are you talking about how they ruined the killing joke with that yeah. little thing right there? Gotcha. That, <laughs> that fucking mess. Yeah. Uh, we, get the, we get the great hardcore scene. When I say hardcore, I mean George C. Scott hardcore scene. Uh, where yeah. where he, <laughs> Commissioner Gordon has oh, to watch his daughter on the video screen. Yeah. <laughs> Turn it off! Turn it off! <laughs> <laughs> That's my daughter! <laughs> that painted fuck is raping my daughter. <laughs> oh, man. We make jokes, but his 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 role again. I don't know how, how I would act if I was watching my daughter get plowed on a video on, on a movie screen, you know. But um, mm. I'd imagine it'd be something like that. Um, yeah. I'd imagine it would be hard. <laughs> but uh, that's, um, that's that's hard times, Daddy. I had to say at least <laughs> once. Straight to the football, baby. Now you know why I write horror and not comedy, man. <laughs> had, had, had to give the Dusty Roads hard times there for at least one time during this show. Right. So if you guys don't like it, I don't, I don't care what you think. Cause, uh, Bull the woods, baby. Bull the woods. Bull the woods. Son of a plumber daddy. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> this has been fun, guys. Lee Russell, where, where can they hear you, sir? Ah, uh, jeez. Uh, after after hearing everything that Cameron's like done in the last couple of weeks and is going to do, I, I feel like a lazy motherfucker. But um, yeah, I'm not doing anything on the on the week of this recording. I'm not actually recording new, but. Um, if you want to hear my stuff, go to tmbdos.podbean.com. That's They Must Be Destroyed on Site. And, yeah, we cover a little bit of everything on our podcast. Uh, we, have a, we have a new host uh, in there, and Daniel's taking a little bit of hiatus as well. So we're kind of in limbo right now kind of thing. We're just kind of doing whatever we want to do. And there's a couple other podcasts on there as well. There's my... Uh, Blood on the Tracks, uh, movie soundtrack podcast that I do every month, uh, and uh, our Cape Ship podcast, where we are covering the Marvel Cinematic Universe chronologically, and that's on a little bit of a hiatus right now, along with uh, Daniel, who's uh, doing bigger and better things on his other podcasts at the moment. So uh, we'll eventually get back to that, but uh, yeah, check that out. Cool. Yeah, all these things uh, you can find, uh, I do on legionpodcast.com at the moment. You can find Blood from the Core. Uh, very first episode should be up by the time this comes out, which is about the Sentinel. Um, those are all those are all horror and thriller films that are New York City based. So I do that with uh, one Derek Bourgeois, who's on many, many podcasts as well. 